So Anthony came up with this wonderful title, which I've changed. <laughs> <laughs> and more accurately, after two days of this, my title is this. <laughs> 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 so I want to um, do a different kind of talk than most of the people that I admire. They can give these great talks of great breadth and depth and wonderfulness. And I just want to make a really small point. So bear with me. So the gist of what I want to tell you is uh, that I want to show you how you can get from analyzing the thermodynamics of information engines to an optimal data representation scheme. So basically, I want to show you how you can get from some simple physical argument straight to machine learning. And you also, along the way, get some new interpretation of Shannon's work, where you'll realize that his information rate you can identify as sort of the least effort that you need to make a data representation, and his channel capacity would be the maximum work potential that you have. And so it's a little bit, here's a little bit of motivation for myself. So two years ago, I told you about this uh, result that we found that Dissipation in driven systems seems to be lower bounded by instantaneous non-predictive information. And then if that's true, that would perhaps have some uh, consequences for living systems and also give us some hints as to what we should be doing when we are doing learning, namely predictive inference, which is what people are doing anyway. So in a way you could say that's not news, but it would be nice. The, my, my personal drive is to just have something in this. In the, so, so the person who talked about the uh, dark secrets of machine learning and AI um, didn't mention what I find is one of the problems, or at least for myself, is just the sheer variety of methods. And then when you study the methods, there are some methods that are well funded in, for example, statistical learning theory, well funded in math, statistics, but um, lots of the methods are created by some person according to something that's somehow reasonable. And as a physicist, I find that kind of not good enough. I would like to have something tangible, physical, that I can hold on to. And so I, after this work here, I, I thought, well, maybe I would like to extend this and generalize it to sort of generic data representation. And that's what I would like to show you today. So to keep the organizers happy, I'll actually address the question of what's an observer. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> OK, so for the purpose of this talk, we'll just go with uh, a working hypothesis that, I mean, obviously, we've been alerted to and sensitized to the intricacy of an observer. And I really liked Matthew's talk about quantum mechanics and how shall we interpret quantum mechanics and is there really the thing out there or is that logically inconsistent? I really like that. I really prescribe to that worldview. And I'm aware that things are subtle. However, I'm going to take this kind of brute force approach here right now because uh, that way I can get somewhere. So I'll just say an observer for right now is a, some data representing entity. So in a way, it's a simple input out of machinery. Data goes in, some energy has to go in, and the representation of data comes out on the other end. Okay. So it's very crude. Here's a little sketch. So if I say the observer is a data representing entity, then I've kind of pushed the problem of definition towards data. Right now I have to tell you what the hell is data. And that's just as difficult. And so really, something very interesting happens that people yesterday have and the day before have been talking about here on this interface when a measurement is being made. And I'm not going to address that. I'm just sort of going to take it for granted. So for me, data is just that stuff that causes this thing to happen. And the observer is then just basically the simple transfer function. So I would then like to sort of look at things from the point of view of the observer. I have some pity on the poor of observer, right? I am an observer. I'm sitting here somehow. I have to do something. What the hell should I do? Perhaps I should make a data representation that's somehow useful. But then that begs the question, useful in what sense? That's probably context dependent. Probably not. So that reminds me of the question you asked yesterday in the, in the panel, right? About the purpose, the living things that have a purpose. It's probably difficult to define a general like, purpose or usefulness for that holds for all situations, right? So this is difficult. 
And then the other intuitive thing is you should probably not waste your resources because you know you have to hunt for your food, so you should use free energy wisely. And uh, Charlie Bennett mentioned yesterday that therefore you should probably implement something like Ocom's Razor, minimize sort of the computational work that you have to do. But again, how exactly are you going to do that? There's this really large diversity of complexity measures and machine learning methods, and they all optimize something, some measure of complexity or minimum descriptive length or whatnot. And like, which one should you choose? How should you do that? So if you're an observer, you're really kind of out there going, hmm, what should I do? So the question then is, uh, can we use some simple physics analysis to guide the way? So, I'm going to describe this interaction that happens here between the, the world, so the environment and the observer, just by that world causing um, external parameters to change. This is kind of like a protocol you would do on the system, so I'm going to view this as like a thermodynamic system that's driven by the environment. So this whole thing you have to imagine is in a heat bath. And the system, your observer, doesn't necessarily have to be an equilibrium system. And so there is this assumption that people in non equilibrium stat mech tend to like to make these days that this observer is kind of small compared to the heat bath. And when we talk about temperature, we'll be talking about the temperature of that heat bath. So um, the, the, this doing this, um, driving this observer from, from one state to another so that it can represent the data, will cost some kind of effort or require some kind of work. I would like to know. It's the minimum effort that I need to um, put in to do this. So, to address uh, the notion of kind of like utility or purpose, let's allow this observer to then do something with this data. So let's allow him to kind of like take work out of the environment. So let's basically model the, 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 what we have just modeled with the environment, let's model it as just another system that the observer can get work out of. So you make a measurement here, you represent your data, and then you use that knowledge to extract some work out of the thing that you measure. And you put a work extraction mechanism in here, there's a choice. And this choice tells you sort of what becomes the variable that's relevant with respect to work extraction. Now, I'm going to then model very crudely the observer as just a simple transfer function, so as a conditional probability distribution, and the same with the work extraction mechanism. Now, what's an information engine? An information engine is going to contain basically these uh, ingredients here, which I've sketched out for you, but I want to spell them out one more time so it's crystal clear. So there's going to be some system which acts as a work source and also an information source, and it's in contact with a heat bath, or it could be multiple heat baths. There is a work extraction mechanism, which is a device that's used to transfer work, couple out work from the system. And this determines, determines, of course, what aspects of the system can work, and so which aspects of the system are relevant with respect to doing work. And this is important. The data representation mechanism contains some measurement device or several measurement devices and the memory. So I'm lumping all of this together. So this distinction that people like to make between measurement and erasure and memory and so on, I'm just going to lump it all together and I'm saying this is what my observer, if you wish, does. Data in representation out. And uh, this data representation me mechanism then doesn't have to be in the same heat bath as the system. You could cool your measurement instrument, for example, and extract work at a different temperature. So in principle, they could be at different temperatures. The information engine then uh, runs a cycle. You first prepare your system for measurement, then you measure, then you keep your data representation, you make it, and then you extract work from your system, and you have to end in the same situation as you started in. Just to give you an example, I'm going to go through all of this again with uh, the large engine. So here is the system that can work. It's this one particle in a box in the heat bath. Uh, the work extraction mechanism, forgive my pathetic drawing, this is kind of partition you put in there that you can move, and then you can somehow lift the weight, couple it to this weight, this terrible drawing. And, uh, the data representation mechanism is another terrible drawing. It's just some kind of thing that tells you where your particle is. 
and your memory then would be the zero and one, right? So the choice of memory here in this uh, drawing is perfectly matched to what's relevant for work extraction, right? Because as soon as I put this partition in the middle, I've made the decision that the thing that's relevant for work extraction is what side of the partition the particle is on. And then in the Zillard box, of course, because Zillard was smart, this is exactly the thing we're going to measure and represent. So, but that wouldn't have to be the case in general, right? You could, you could screw yourself up here. You could, for example, measure that particle to a higher precision and then you would be losing all that work potential because you haven't stabilized the outcome, right? The, the putting in this partition sort of stabilizes the distribution of that thing, but only to a certain coarse graining. Like imagine, for example, you'd measure where that particle is and you'd give it like three variables. So like, is it in the left third of the box or the middle or the right third of the box, then you would lose information about, it. you wouldn't have one bit of information about the relevant quantity you'd have left. Right? So you can screw yourself over. You can also screw yourself over mightily by measuring the y axis instead of the x axis. Right? So there's many ways in which you can capture a lot of information, but it's not useful because it doesn't allow you to couple to the work extraction mechanism. And this is kind of the point I want to make, that you should keep that in mind. That the work potential you have isn't just the information you have about the system, it's the relevant information you have about the quantity that can do the work. Okay, so then let's go through the other side of like running the engine, just so that you see how this thing works. So you prepare the system by putting in this partition, then you measure the system, so you go from this state where you, your, your kind of pointer here, this is a very crude picture, right, it's flopping around thermally, to a, uh, to a situation in which it's correlated, with the position of the particle. And uh, then you run the work extraction, so you attach your, your weight and all that and move your partition this way, and then you end in the same situation as before. You decouple your weight and you've lifted this weight a little bit. I didn't have the time to put like a little two bars and a delta H here. Then. Ran out of time, sorry. But the weight hopefully went up. So the, that's how you extract the work. Okay, so now I want to remind you just of my notation. So again, the observer is going to be modeled by this condition of probability distribution here. And now let's look at the, the free energy change during this, uh, this cycle of this machine. So the first part of the cycle was doing this measurement, representing the data. Um, there you are basically changing the distribution of outcomes from a distribution <coughs> that in the Zollard engine would be just one half, right? One half probability uh, that the outcome is zero, one half is one. So some average measurement outcome, you're changing that with your protocol to this non-equilibrium distribution which represents what you have measured. And to make this change, you need to expend some, uh, some energy. So here's the free energy change that you encounter it when you make this change. This is the average non-equilibrium free energy that you have after you make the change minus the free equi non-equilibrium free energy you have before the change. So I'm using this notion of non-equilibrium free energy, which comes from, I mean, which has been becoming more and more popular over the last 20 years. Jasinski's work, Cook's work, but also before that, the work of others. For example, Rob Shaw mentioned this in his, uh, in his book in like 86 for the first time. And there's uh, some Japanese guys who've done a lot of work on this and uh, provided many proofs of why the relative entropy between the actual distribution and the corresponding equilibrium distribution actually is the amount of work that you could additionally get out of the system. Some of these proofs are constructive proofs that show you how you can do it. I like those. There's especially this one guy called Takara, which made a really nice paper with this huge literature. So anyway, so I'm using this concept of non-equilibrium free energy, which I'm not the only person who's using it. So there's a growing community of people who kind of like think it makes sense. However, there's still um, other physicists who think, you know, once you use this, you're in the realm of religion because like, this is not physics anymore because what are you talking about? You're out of equilibrium and you're talking about free energy. What is the temperature? And like I said, the assumption is that the system is small compared to the size of the bath, so you're talking about the temperature of the bath. So, um, <laughs> the ana five minutes. The analysis here shows you that the free energy change you encounter here is proportional to the mutual information you capture. 
And this here is the total average energy change, right? You can work, write that out as the work you do plus the heat that you exchange with the bath. And for optimal measurements, there's a good argument that Tom Aldrich makes that you can make this go to zero. And then you really see that the um, minimum effort, because this is the free energy change, so it's the minimum amount of work you would have to do. So then you really see, if you, if you arrange it so that the total change in energy is zero, the minimum effort is, the mutual, is proportional to the mutual information. And that gives you this insight that um, Shannon's coding rate where um, you, you're minimizing overall possible data representations, this quantity under a constraint on the fidelity that you keep really is a principle of, min of least effort. You're, you're minimizing the effort you're making when you represent data, so that's kind of neat. And um, if you keep these two quantities, then again, you can use a second law to, to say that at least you have to spend that much effort uh, to do this, and the minimum amount of heat that you have to dissipate is uh, the heat is lower bound by this information. So the more information you capture, the, the more dissipative you're going to be. And since information is non-negative, you're actually dissipating heat in this step. In the next step, you are changing the... Um, so, so your measurement implies that you know something about the relevant quantity. So you use Bayes' rule here. You have measured this thing, right? You know this thing. You have to know something about the, the physics, which in, is encoded in this, as your work extraction mechanism, so you can compute this. So this gives you, um, the, the free energy of this thing gives you your maximum work potential. And then you lose that work potential and get work out of the thing. So you have a negative sign here. So that's the maximum work potential. So again, you see that's proportional to the, pr the relevant information here. If the average change in energy can be arranged to be zero, it's directly proportional to it. And in the general case, the absorbed heat will be upper bound by it. So you can never absorb more heat from the environment than you have captured relevant information. Now you put this all together by noting that if you close the cycle, the total change in energy will be zero, right? So before I talked about that you could possibly arrange it so that during the measurement, this could be zero. And during the work extraction, this could be zero. There are many ways in which you can arrange this. But what should always be zero is this, because you end in the same state you started. Okay, so this is always true. So then the work that you put in minus the work you get out is the same as the heat that you get out minus the heat that flows in. And so this is like the dissipation. And this dissipation then is lower bound by this functional. So I'm just putting together the things on these two slides. So this one here and this one here, right? Putting these two together, and I see that this dissipation is lower bound by this functional, which is the total information you've captured about your system times the temperature at which you are doing this, uh, minus that part of the information that's relevant with respect to work extraction times the temperature at which you will extract the work. And nicely, this is exactly the functional that the information bottleneck minimizes. So if you now go ahead and say, I want to optimize my observer or my data representation mechanism um, such that the minimally achievable dissipation is as small as possible. So I'm going to adjust this p of y given x, x which is my, my transfer function for my observer, such as to minimize this functional, then you have exactly, precisely, mathematically the information bottleneck method, which tells you that you should be keeping relevant information in your data compression. And so you have uh, done the whole path from a simple physical argument to a machine learning algorithm. So here's a bunch of algorithms you can derive from this. And some of them, like the slow feature analysis, is actually developed in the context of neuroscience. So there's a uh, reason to believe that this is not entirely in the blue and in the realm of theory, but actually applies to real systems, perhaps. So, um, yeah, this was also the take-home message for information theory, and then uh, I'm done. <laughs>